Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I wanted to go ahead and welcome back Tracy Morello from Creekside Studio to go ahead and talk to us about how to curate your print. And we were experiencing some technical difficulties on the day of the conference. So I'm very happy that Tracy has graciously agreed to come back and redo this bit. Uh, so Tracy, I met you years ago at Flatbed Press where you were a master printer there. And then two years ago, you started your studio at Creekside. Well, I guess Creekside Studio is at Canopy, uh, which is an art complex here in Austin. And so I think you've been open about two years and you have a show that's happening right now. Can you tell us about the work that you have in your, in your studio? Yeah, our show for Print Austin, we have, uh, we're featuring in collaboration with Gallery Show Creek, um, Koichi Yamamoto, and uh, we're calling it Static Dynamic. He has two new pieces, uh, two new engraving Italian pieces with Chincolé that are huge, 50 by 18 inches that he made in his living room. He, uh, during COVID, had just turned his living room into a studio and uh, began making art. And so we have a couple of those pieces, uh, amazing. And uh, the kites hanging from the ceiling and then a few of the mono uh, types that he's done earlier. Um, and also we have a uh, Creekside co-founder, Tina White's his new photo gravier series, uh, telescoping landscapes that we've been working on. And then, you know, all the founders. Uh, of Creekside. Uh, there's uh, Tina Weitz, uh, June Wan, and Veronica Chechi, and uh, Cordelia Blanchard all have a piece in the show. So. Okay, wonderful. We love Koichi. He was our keynote speaker for that conference. He's great, and I love all the work of your other founders. And I guess we'll go ahead and roll your video. Okay, sounds good. Hello, this is Tracy from Creekside Studio. I am going to talk to you this morning a little bit about printmaking and curating your prints. Um, save a couple of bucks. First, uh, you probably want to have a pretty good ruler. I like the metal ones. They're a little bit thinner, uh, easier to get closer to the paper uh, when you're using it for curating. Um, the fan brush. Uh, this is a really this is my favorite one. It's super soft. It's good for when you're erasing, um, you know, just kind of clean off the print without having to use your actual hand. Um, and then I keep on hand a jar, uh, fill it with a little bit of water and get a little paintbrush. And this will help when you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, take off a chine collé, uh, loosen up the glue, or if you have a ding in your print on the paper, um, you know, you can just go over with a little bit of water and uh, then smooth it out with a burnisher to kind of, you know, soften up the f paper fibers and gently um, burnish out the the, the ding. And uh, also whenever you're curating some ink off of the margins and you really, if you have to go far into the margin down to the paper pulp, uh, you know, this will actually help put the pulp back down and you'll never even know it happened. Uh, <laughs> and this, believe it or not, is a drywall sandpaper block. And I use this whenever I have a, want to try to recreate a decal or if the paper tear didn't quite happen the way I wanted it to and it's a little bit of rough uh, jagged on the sides and not very uniform with the others, then you can use this block to kind of, um, you know, file off those big paper uh, paper edges and then um, a burnisher. Yes, you need a burnisher and all curating so that you can put your pulp back down on the on the print after you've curated that area. Um, erasers, uh, lots of lots and lots of I could talk for days about erasers. This eraser is actually called the Alvin uh, dr uh, dry cleaning pad and you can get these at uh, any local art supply shop or online they're about eight dollars and it's just it's a soft fiber and it's filled with um, powdered uh, gum eraser and so if you have some graphite or pencil marks 
off into the margins, it just very gently will, will clean them off and not pick up the paper pulp at all. And so you could just do that and then, you know, use your fan brush and, uh, and, and take off the dust. Uh, the vanish is uh, great, but I tend to go through them very quickly. It's super soft uh, racer, but I like it a lot. Uh, Faber Castle. Castle is uh, soft. It's also another very soft one. Um, but it's great because when you're erasing, uh, the little bits that come off of the eraser will just roll right up into a ball. And um, then you can just easily get rid of those. By far the best right here. <laughs> this is a vinyl eraser, um, the Stat Stadler. And it is uh, probably my very favorite. You, it, it actually will not only get pencil off and smudges, but it can actually take off ink uh, off of your print if it's a very light uh, spot of ink that you're trying to get off. So these guys are great. And also what you can do with them is, uh, you know, say you have just a little bit of an area, a hard part that you just want to go into, you can cut it down to any shape, a triangle, square, just like a little point, whatever you need. Uh, this you can cut them down and, and make any kind of angle that you need and they're soft but they also will hold up very well whereas these will disappear very quickly. So these are your erasers that um, I would consider to be the very best. And this is a ceramics tool and it has a, a wedge or a very tip uh, point on it and this can be used to tip in ink um, so some something happens on the while you're printing and some area of the print didn't get ink then uh, and you have to tip it in and it's always best if you're having to do that having to tip in some ink is to do it when it's wet um, to try to tip a print whenever it's dry it will just you will always see that you did that uh, and so my advice is to do that while it's wet and this is glassine that you know just the regular glassine that you make uh, you know covers for your interleave, interleaving for your for your prints and any kind of scraps I just keep it because it's great to use when you're having to you know if you have that spot that you have to burnish down you put this on top of the print and then burnish on this part and it's smooth and uh, we'll keep the print clean when you you know try not to touch it anymore and, and make sure that it's ready to go okay so that is Pretty much uh, what I always keep in my bag of curating bag of uh, all, you know, just whatever situations. Oh, and let, let me not forget here, a box of razors. Uh, you always need a, a razors. These straight edge razors are the best. And these are what I use to take off ink, curate chincolé, uh, just any kind of curating is always done with the straight edge razors. So a box of those. Okay, clear this off to do a little curating to show you. Uh, I have a print here that I'm working with Tina White. Uh, she is one of the Creekside Studio founders and artists, and uh, we're working on a new series of hers uh, called Telescoping Landscapes. And this one is the uh, Sugar Cane Twister, and it is a uh, a, a gravier plate that has a little bit of a chincolé up on the top part and I don't know if you could see right here it has a little bit of the edge uh, you know where it expanded and went outside the image and I, I need to take that off because uh, we definitely don't want that to show up uh, <laughs> and you don't want to lose the print because you have a little bit of that going on so what I do is I line the ruler up exactly on the edge and then I'll take one of my straight edge razors and uh, score the chien collet paper. This is a Kozo, so it's a very, very uh, lightweight, very sheer paper. And I just score that lightly. I don't want to go through the support paper, the BFK Reeves. I don't want to go through that. And um, just want to take off the, the Kozo. And so then I take my brush and then I just kind of wet the part of the Kozo that I want to pull back and loosen it up from the glue, the chincolé paste. And then you take your straight edge razor and you pick it up on the corner. So you can see right here, 
pulling up a little bit of that chine collet. That area that uh, is had the collet part on there. Now we can just take our burnisher and our uh, glassine paper, take a little tear a little bit off, and go in on top, and then just burnish down on the edge, just very carefully. Okay. Sometimes you might want to if there's a little there's a little bit of ink residue hanging out. So you might have to go in and erase a little bit and that will pick up the paper pulp a little bit. Um, and so there, that chinkele is now gone. <laughs> and uh, just now you just want to lay the pulp down on the paper. And it's pretty, it's dry at this point. Uh, you don't want to get it super wet, just enough to lift up the cozo, you know, separate it from the glue. And that is how you take off a little bit of chine collet. If you have some, because when it's wet, you know, sometimes it tends to, to swell up a little bit. Um, so there you have it. One print. Done. And there we go. This one had a little bit of uh, an ink spot from when I had ink on my hand and I must have, uh, when I was pinning it up, I must have somehow put my inky finger on there. And for these, uh, you know, you're just going to take the straight edge razor again and you want to hold it, you know, pretty much straight up and down, maybe slight angle and go along the ink and you just I guess uh, I would say you're shaving it shaving off a little bit you're actually taking off the paper pulp and you're removing the ink and this you can only do this after the print has completely dried you never want to try to go in and pull ink off the margins um, you know when it's wet because all you'll end up doing is pulling off or actually smashing down the ink into the pulp a little bit further, making it even harder to get off. Um, and so, you know, this, uh, if, you, if you do see that you've gotten a big ink spot on there, and if you can lift up the paper and on there in the back and you can see the ink spot, then you can't, that's done. You can't do that. You'll end up making a hole before you can actually get that done. Um, and so there uh, is completely gone. Um, love that straight edge razor and then I go over the top with a little bit of the Stadler uh, vinyl eraser and just kind of smooth the pulp get it all even you don't want to have it um, you know a little bit uneven you'll be able to see that and again you want to take your glassine paper and uh, go over the whole section again and just take your burnisher and you, you just lightly do it maybe go into a little bit of a circle if um, this paper was textured um, you know it would be a little bit harder to make it not be seen this is a BFK and it's pretty smooth if you have a highly textured paper and you're trying to clean off the ink then I, I would definitely say you would need to go ahead and do every step we just did but then uh, you might want to spritz a print and then uh, drip, blot it and then put it underneath uh, some sheetrock just get a couple of pieces of sheetrock and and uh, some newsprint put it on top and then and then let it uh, put it underneath and let it sit and dry so that the the pulp can kind of reshape itself underneath the block it'll all get flat again and you won't be able to tell that you've had an area that you had to go in and curate um, but that again that's that's super texture paper where this is uh, definitely not a texture paper okay so there's a, another print um, uh, that has been able to go into the addition and we didn't have to lose a print Okay, welcome back. 
with Tracy Morello. We wanted to go ahead, I have some questions from the other day and I wanted to go ahead and um, ask you those. So there was a question about the hardest thing you've had to curate and how you did it. Yeah, that was a um, piece of Mashi paper. It was probably, uh, that was a James Searles project that we were doing and the block uh, was four feet by eight feet long. And so we had to find paper that was big enough. And uh, so we were using the, the Japanese paper uh, Mashi. And um, that is about $300 a sheet. <laughs> Whoa. And so, yeah, and you don't want to mess up uh, something that's that expensive and rare and beautiful. And so uh, anyway, we had a, a, where the block, because the block was too big for the press, we had to stop the press, lift it up, move the block, put it back down. You know, all these things entail to print a block that's too big for your press. And so we had a little bit of a mark on the margin. Uh, and so black ink was in the margin and I had to curate that out. And since it is such a sheer uh, paper and curating it out, uh, you could almost see through it <laughs> like a hole. And so I had to um, learn to make the paper. I had to basically take scraps of mashi and make mashi paper on the margins again. And oh that is God. hard to do, yeah. <laughs> so. Wow, and so the reason why you didn't try and take that out with it, it doesn't work with an eraser because it's the paper is so fine. Well, in wood blocks, it was a big wood block that he had carved in 1988. Uh, the piece is called Through It All. And uh, so the, the block, we had to stack the ink. Uh, you know, you when you're printing a wood block, it's all about hearing. And so you have to make sure that you have even coverage and you stack the ink. Oh, there's a lot of ink for it to go through and make a really pure black. Uh, not, you know, otherwise it might be grayish. It might not be just, uh, you know, so jet black is what he wanted. Um, and so, yeah, we had a lot of ink on there. And so when you have a thick amount of ink, it's down in the pulp of the paper. You know, by the time it goes to the press, it is really mashed in there. And so if your paper is really thin, it's almost gone through the whole, you know, the whole thing all the way to the back. Right. But it, it didn't go all the way to the back, almost. But still, too much, uh, you could see it. <laughs> wow, and how many prints did you have to do that to? Uh, we, the edition was a 15. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, let me see. Um, how long have you been curating prints or been a master printer, I guess? Uh, well, I've been professionally printing for 16 years now. Yeah. That's, that's remarkable. So um, do, I guess, do you have a favorite project that you worked on? Yeah, I do. Oh, well, I have a lot of them. I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, I do tend to like the real color pieces. <laughs> like, uh, you know, uh, John Greer was a really good one um, where he had brought in some plates, some Lexan that he had made experimental matrices with, uh, burning in an image, kind of like what you think of dry point, but he was using a fire, like an etching into it. And uh, so we did monotype printing to where, or it's more of a viscosity printing to where you're doing layers of different inks with different levels of oil. You know, viscosity printing is where you're stacking the level of oils, so whether mm. the ink is going to mix or they're going to stay on top of each other, you know, and it's unpredictable in what color you might get. So I'd say viscosity printing is going to be my favorite. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's tricky. A lot of people are nervous of that because they never know what kind of results you're going to get. <laughs> that's the beauty of it, you know, <laughs> almost. It's, uh, you can't control it. You really can't. You can try, but, uh, and um, that's kind of printmaking to me. <laughs> yeah. So you were, you were, let me see, in your video, you talked about the Alvin dry cleaning pad. I'm curious, like, what you use that on? That's for when you have prints that are signed. Um, you know, I use that a lot. I think a lot of, uh, you know, galleries and museums use those type of, uh, that type of eraser because uh, you, you have a piece that's already finished. You can't dip it in the water. You can't do any other kind of curating. Maybe it's signed. And so you wanna be able just to go in on the edges say you have graphite, pencil marks, smudges, some kind of dirt that might have gotten on the print, then that will go in and clean up the margins uh, mm. without picking up any of the paper pulp 
it'll just take the dirt off. Okay. So those, are, those are very, I, I say everybody should get those. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen those before. I've never seen those before. Um, you can get it at any art supply store. They're like $8. Okay. Know? Yeah, you can, um, uh, Jerry's, Blicks, I mean, <laughs> any of those. And you use that for mostly pencil or graph or um, graphite mark? Dirt, you know, yeah. dirt, dust, uh, you know, after the year, after years go by, even in your flat file, things have a way of just getting dirty. And yeah. So, you know, then you take it out and you can do your, um, your Alvin dry cleaning pad, <laughs> take away all the smudges without any kind of uh, damage, you know, it's archival, it's just gum eraser in there. So. What about van the vanish eraser? I hadn't heard of that one either. What do you that's like to use Korean, that one for? That's a, that's a Korean one um, that I found at the art supply. You know, that's, I love going through and just like spending hours <laughs> looking at erasers and pencils and things like that. Uh, and so I found this one. I, it's, it's super soft, but it's not like the need erasers. Um, the only thing is it, 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 you use it. Uh, I mean, it just it disappears. It's like it's mm. name. it just vanishes. <laughs> Boom, <laughs> poof. And so, you know, economically, that is uh, one that's kind of pricey, you know, but if you have a special piece and you need a really soft eraser, um, that would be the one. Yeah. Okay. So you, let me see. I'm curious about the, um, about the drywall sanding sponge because I have never, I've never even thought to use something like that. Um, so I guess maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, you know, um, and when you're tearing down your additions and sometimes you are within, you know, just like not even a quarter inch, maybe, a, you know, just like a sliver, a couple, couple of notches there, sixteenths, um, that you need to take off. And sometimes you just can't tear it. And so it's really uneven. And I was trying to figure out because if you cut it with a razor, it's very clear that that is right. not a natural tear, it doesn't look good. And plus in addition, you want them all to match. Uh, and so sometimes if you have an uneven edge like that, it's really big in spots, you can take the drywall um, block and just like file it away. And, and it's kind of like you're sanding it away. And also then you take a one side that's really coarse to get the big nubs down. And then on the smooth side, uh, the fine side of the, the sponge block, then you take that and you can kind of almost recreate a deco if you want. Um, you can, it's just amazing what you can do with those. And so those are great when you're trying to get all your uh, addition to look the same, you know. Yeah, that is clever. I would love to be with you in a art supply store or even Come on, let's go. Even a hardware store. I know. I love the hard that's a, that's how when I was going to school, I would go to Callahan's and uh, you know, I couldn't afford the art, the oil sticks, you know, those were so expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. so uh, I found in Callahan's just walking through they used these really big round ones for 89 cents that they were marking cattle with. Uh, because they didn't want to brand them anymore and so they were using these these uh, oil sticks and so I got the primary colors and then a white a silver and a black you know and went and made a lot of art with, with those <laughs> you know, cents, you know <laughs> shine art sticks so yeah and you know and even with Koichi uh, you know talking to him a little bit about uh, some of his uh, monotypes that he was making in Italy he was I was like how you know how is this done or whatever it's just like you know printer talk and uh, he said that he uh, you just kind of sometimes you don't have the supplies you you need and so he needed uh, <laughs> he needed something to, to roll the ink out and kind of uh, create texture. And so I think he ended up in a hardware store buying a plunger and placing that down on the plexi and twisting it. And he made these amazing like bird type things in his, you know, because it was sort of a landscape piece. Um, wow. Amazing what you're going to do, what you find at the hardware store. <laughs> Very clever. Yeah. Very clever. Okay, cool. So, oh, the ceramics tool. Some, I remember someone asked about that. So, I mean, um, tipping in ink, you kind of mentioned that in your video. And um, I, so I guess, I guess tell us a little bit about tipping in ink, how the best way to do that. 
Okay, yeah. So, you know, uh, and again, that was, a, you know, my friend that works in ceramics told me that's a shaping tool, because um, usually they'll have a little wedge to them or a point. And that one that I showed you in the video had both. Mm. Uh, my original ones were just the wedge they look like a little wedge, a little rubber wedge on it. And so in all the years of having to, when you're printing and say there's a little section of your print that doesn't get any ink. And so you immediately, you need to go in and tip it. Um, and so used to, you would have to take a paintbrush and then tip it down in repeatedly like that. And I found that you could always see that because the thickness of it or whatever, you just could not get it to, uh, to blend and so I wanted mm. something to make it blend and that's when it, you know shopping and going around the art store I ended up looking for something kind of ru like rubber and end up in ceramics uh, section and so yeah so you always want to tip um, and you, you know find whatever you like but I like the ceramic tool for that and uh, tip it in when it's wet you know put it up on the wall or put it down on the table, usually up on the walls best, put some clips up on there and put it up on the wall so that you can see it the way that it's going to be presented. You know, putting prints down on the table and curating them that way, that's not what they're gonna look like. They're gonna look different when they're hanging up. So you hang it up so that you get the light to come down on it and then you tip it in while it's wet. Um, and usually you're just like barely, and then you're gonna blend it in around where the tip is happening so that it's not noticeable. Um, that's usually how I tip. Tip that's great. Okay, that's a good tip. So as someone who does a lot of printing for other people, when do you find time to do your own work and what kind of direction is it heading into right now? Before, never. <laughs> when I was working professionally as a master printer, you're, yeah, probably there's not much time for that. Um, and usually you're very engrossed in what you're doing, the project mm. that you're in, and it's, you know, that's very satisfying. So for my own work, um, it's been with my own studio, a little, I, I find work all the time. That's like a priority now. <laughs> I'm all the time um, here carving uh, during COVID, uh, carving blocks. I have old uh, copper, I have copper everywhere. <laughs> Cause there's a little, you know, you can do a lot with hand tools. Uh, and things like that, and uh, photo trays and ferric acid. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I just try to keep on. I have a lot. I made a lot of monotypes. You know, when the studio first opened, and I was just like, "Wow, I'm I'm so excited!" And so, all I did for days would just be different kinds of monotypes, uh, laying down inks, do different layers, doing trace monotypes, you know, drawings uh, and things like that. And so now I have them all here at the house and I just keep adding to them. I just never, so either at home or at the studio, I just, I'm constant because that's where you, you know, as a printer yourself, <laughs> that's where it's at. You know, I just, I don't know, I guess it's a whole new world now. And I also do still work with other people. I enjoy collaborating with other artists. There's something really magical in that. Um, when you get together with someone and, and say they, they just come in with a very open mind and just like, let's see what this is gonna do. Let's see what's gonna happen. And let it let the matrix talk to you, you know? And that's what we do. And I'm just there to help them. Like I'm just there to mix the ink colors and you know, it's their vision. And um, yeah, I just, I really love that part also. So it's a good mix now. Well, that's great. I'm glad that you're finding time to do your own work. So for, for people that are interested in doing this collaborative um, work with you, I know that things haven't quite loosened up yet as vaccines are, are just kind of now trickling into um, our area. But should someone want to start the dialogue, how, to, how do they make that happen? Just uh, can email me at the uh, hello at Creekside uh, Studio ATX.com and just uh, start a dialogue. Just start, we'll talk about your project. Like right now, I, I am in dialogue with people. It's like whatever your matrix is. And then uh, we can talk about what direction you may want to go and how big the addition is. And uh, right now, if you have a matrix that you have, uh, you can drop that by and I can run some proofs and we can do Zoom. You know, there's Zoom that you're not going to be able to color, do the colors on the computer. Uh, but we can definitely, like I do a distance work right now with uh, Tina White's uh, because, you know, the COVID, now she's over in Washington. And so uh, what I do, she tells me, you know, what colors she wants and kind of what her vision is. And then I run a bunch of color trial proofs. Um, I probably did, I don't know, 10 of those for her. And then, um, and you know, we have a history, so I know 
she likes Shinkole and Ala Pupe and these kinds of things. And so I do the, a bunch of them, send them to her as color trios, and then she looks through them and she'll say, okay, you know, I, let's do, you know, a right to print or a BAT and she'll sign it. And then she can send that back to me and I can complete the edition. So we can do it long distance um, like that, you know, so, so and uh, Mark Burkhart, same thing. I'm working with him and I'm, we're ha he's, uh, he's a printmaker, uh, <laughs> it is very hands-on, but right now we're having to just do uh, color trials and uh, to see how, which direction it's gonna go. But yeah, we probably won't pull the bat until after, after, you know, we can get together. They right, probably okay. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, everybody's yeah. hopeful. Okay, well that's good. So people can at least begin the dialogue with you and maybe possibly do some work with you before needing to meet face-to-face. -face. Um, and hello at creeksidestudioatx.com. That's it. Okay, great. All right, well, did you want to say anything else about what's coming up on, on the horizon for you or for Creekside? Uh, yeah, um, I guess we're going to be uh, finishing uh, the telescoping landscapes. Uh, Mark, Mark Burkhart, uh, we have one coming up, and New Julie Speed, uh, you know, two, new, two more editions being completed. Um, let's see. And uh, yeah, just, I guess everybody, I think Veronica Chechi <laughs> will be coming out with some new work, I've heard, uh, in the near future. And June Wong's working on some blocks, uh, some wood blocks. So, uh, and Tina has some new new stuff from her photos, her photo photo stuff, uh, sacred lands that she takes, the photos are amazing. So yeah, everybody has some work coming up. So just check in, we have, check in a website, look at our news, uh, our events. And uh, I hope to, I hope to be working with some new artists soon, as soon as COVID's. Right, well, it, it does, it does seem hopeful, like things are, are I don't know, things seem to be at least moving in the right direction. Okay, well, thank you, Tracy, for humoring us again with, um, <laughs> yeah. with uh, muddling through our initial audio uh, issues. So I really appreciate your time. So. Of course, anytime. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It was, it was a lot of fun. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>